Uh, let's pray as we open up for equipping hour, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, God, I do praise you for, uh, Lord, just your grace. Lord, the fact that we are able to meet uh, together in this church is just your mercy and your kindness towards us. Lord, that we're able to preach and teach from your word that we're able to communicate the gospel with clarity, Lord, in a context, Lord, where we do not suffer from persecution nor fears and threats uh, from those outside. But Lord, there is an environment for us to be able to hear these things and be built up. Lord, I pray we wouldn't take advantage of those things in a negative way and, Lord, become those who shrink back. Um, Lord, we need to be those who not only are growing in times of safety and times of ease, but also stepping into environments that are difficult and hard. Lord, be with this equipping hour. I pray it's a joy and an encouragement uh, to everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I think everybody knows me. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lehman, and uh, I am the operations officer for Finisterre. Finisterre is an organization that basically comes alongside of local churches, and um, we help them send their missionaries or church planters to Papua New Guinea. So we are not the church, and uh, we do not raise up individuals nor qualify them for ministry. That's not our role. That's the church's role. But what we do is we provide the infrastructure they need to be able to actually get in there and do their ministry. Uh, locations, strategic things, logistic items. Um, we put the uh, stamp in their passport for entry visas to get into the country. Uh, all those logistical things. And those are things I get excited about. As an operations guy, uh, these are things that are just near and dear to my heart. And so some of the things I want to go through this morning, I'm just, we're going to look at the logistics in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the last time that we were here, and I was speaking on this, um, I was working through the languages in Papua New Guinea. This time is going to be logistics, and it's also going to be strategic locations. But something I want to go through first is I just want to give an update on where Finisterre is. Uh, most recently, um, as many of you know, there was an earthquake in Papua New Guinea, um, resulting in the home for not only the Cairns, but also for the Mitchells in the village of Maiaroro being destroyed. And I wanted to give a before and after photo here to be able to see that. Um, you know, the houses, uh, to use a talk piss and expression, uh, the houses are now sleeping on the ground, is how they would say that. Now, where we had posts and everything was elevated with a sure foundation, uh, you know, when the earthquake, earthquake hit, which was a 7.6, um, for the Mitchell's house, it really just seems like uh, all the cross bracing broke and the house fell to the side. But for the Cairns house, there actually was a decent amount of cross bracing, and so the house actually just kind of fell down and slightly to the right. Um, as a result of that, uh, you have foundations that are messed up, girding beams that are fractured, floor trusses, trusses that are fractured, uh, walls that are out of whack and out of shape. Uh, and so really the homes are destroyed. There isn't a way for us to be able to get in there with a crane, uh, as some of the people in the village have asked. You know, just fly a crane in here. And then that crane can prop them up. It's like, do you understand what you're asking? Um, but for them, the solution is, yeah, let's get a crane in here. We'll get it fixed. And we don't have a, a clear path in terms of what it looks like forward in terms of fixing them. Uh, but at this point, we're praying and thinking through strategy of what those things would look like. But we're thankful for the homes. Uh, they've, they've served their purpose for a duration of ministry. Uh, and the Lord is the one that's brought them to this close. Uh, one of the things that's helpful, I thought this was fascinating. Since August of 2017, there have been 76 earthquakes in the Finisterre region, measuring from 4.5 and greater. 76, not two, not three, 76 earthquakes. And so these homes have actually sustained a tremendous amount of shaking over a duration of time. This is just the one that the Lord used as a means to bring them down. And so as you think through things to be praying for in the midst of that. We'll be praying for the Cans, be praying for the Mitchells. Uh, I've spoken with Zach uh, quite a bit uh, since all of this happened, and he's doing well, but also just sitting in the middle of a season that's just difficult and hard, or wrestling with the emotions that would obviously be felt in a season like this. Uh, and then interacting with the Mitchells who are distant from it, uh, just being able to have some clarity in things. Uh, they're not feeling the emotions in exactly the same way. They're still there. Um, but it's just sweet sitting down with Ryan, and he's like, oh, we're going to rebuild them. God broke our houses. It's going to be great. I'm like, all right, good, yeah. I'm going to get behind Ryan and what's going on with the houses. So as you think about it, be praying for them. Be praying for the people in the village, too. There is a tendency and animistic thinking to assume that 
the individuals that have brought a message that is foreign to our environment, those individuals, um, their homes have been destroyed. And the individuals that are associated with their new message, uh, we need to actually think about what they're communicating. Because if things are going poorly for them, maybe that means this message is a message we shouldn't be believing. That's a common misconception that will show up uh, within the village. And God is able to overcome those things. That doesn't mean we need to have fear in those things. Uh, God has not only supplied us with the means, which is his word, uh, to be able to combat thinking that is not right. Uh, God will supply uh, our team in there with the right tools to be able to communicate and give clarity on how the people need to think about an event like this. The next item for us to look at is uh, the team in Medang and just giving an update on Medang. Uh, for those who remember sending out the cans, the Dodds, and the Laymans uh, to us and P&G back in 2014, uh, no doubt you remember our family's role uh, was setting up the logistical administrative structure for Finisterre. Uh, so we really were thinking about primary ministry happening in the Finisterre Mountains and then looking to the Laymans as supporting uh, that primary ministry in the Finisterres. And so it's, hey, get everything set up organizationally. And uh, let's go ahead and get houses built and things like that, set up the logistical infrastructure needed to supply them and keep them there. But that was it. Primary ministry was really focused on the Finisterres. And we've made a shift in that organizationally. Uh, we see a need for church planting to be happening in Medang itself. And so we really have two primary roles of church planting or primary focuses of church planting in PNG. Not only the town of Medang and surrounding areas, but then also looking at the Finisterres still. Those are two primary roles. And so as we think about Team Medang and the Twombly's are right here, um, we need to think about it in terms of four points. And I've got them up on the list here. Church strengthening and planting in Medang Town. Translation of discipleship resources in the trade language of Melanesian Pidgin. Provide administrative logistical support for all church planting teams. And then providing pastoral training. Uh, that, that's not a task list for one family. Uh, that's a task list for multiple families. And it's not a skill set for one person. Uh, if that was, that'd be a pretty interesting looking individual that was able to do all those things effectively uh, and do it quickly. Um, and so as you think about that, Medang, our focus on Medang, our view of Medang, the team of Medang, it's just growing. Uh, we want to be able to see a large emphasis on Medang. If we have a roll of Medang that is just very small, and we've only got one family there, but we want to send 12 more teams into the Finisterres, um, well, those individuals in Medang are not going to be able to keep up with that workload. And ministry in Medang is something that really wouldn't be able to go anywhere. We would constantly be working to supply the individuals that are in the Finisterres. And so we want to have two to three families go with the Twombly's. Well, I would say one to two more families go with them. Brian's over here saying, send one more. Um, but if we had two to three families total and individuals that are in that team have overlap in their skill sets, then we have an effective team. Uh, we don't want to have one family that goes and they've got um, two points on that list of four items that we listed. And then we have another family that goes and they've only got uh, one, and then another one that goes, and they've only got two. We want to be able to have individuals that have overlap in all of those things. And so as we're thinking about Team Medang, just give consideration to those things. Uh, I'm not sure what your skill set is, but if there's a skill set that matches that list, uh, give consideration to, to Team P&G and Team Medang in particular, if it would make sense for you to be part of those things. Final item here is really just ministry here in the States. How are things going in the USA? Uh, the Twombly's are presently in training with us uh, and also with Scott Maxwell. It's just been very sweet. Uh, they're going to be with us until November, first week in November, and then heading back to Stewart, Florida, uh, their home church there, Community Baptist Church. Uh, they will be hanging out until March of uh, next year, 2023. And then our plan as a family, the layman's, is to actually go with them to Papua New Guinea. Uh, our goal is to be there for six months. Uh, we want to be able to not only provide them with good orientation into Tok Pisin uh, for the language, but also culture. Um, at the same time, there's other items we want to be able to do. I want to make sure that we're able to visit other directors of other mission organizations. And so that's something Brian needs to know, heads of other organizations, to be able to form relationships with them, maintain relationships we presently have. We have an agent that is in Port Moresby. 
uh, who handles government documentation for us. That's someone else that he's going to need to meet. And then I really need to think through and assess our present infrastructure in Papua New Guinea and then be able to make plans over the next five years. What does that look like? How do we need to develop those things? What are considerations we don't have right now we need to be thinking about? Uh, if we had another family, one, two, three, four more families that said, hey, we're ready to go, do we have the infrastructure currently to be able to support them on the field? And those questions need to be answered. And so the time there in P&G will be able to serve that purpose. So we move into the next items on my list here. I want to be able to think about, again, languages, logistics, strategic locations, church planting in Papua New Guinea. But I want to think about it first just biblically. Um, and I'm not saying I want to look at the book of Acts and say, however Paul did it, that's how we need to do it with logistics. If he was on a ship that was 200 feet long, we have to find a 200-foot two foot long ship. Sir, how long is your ship? It's 180 feet. We can't use that. It's not biblical. Um, we're not after that. But what we want to look at is we want to look at just logistics. What was the framework that the gospel spread in in the book of Acts? Um, what were the tools that were already there? What were the things that the apostles seamlessly stepped into, namely Paul, as the gospel spread all throughout the Roman Empire? And this is what I want to look at. So sometimes, well, maybe this would be a good way to think about it. There are times where I'll interact with somebody who's a sweet friend. Now, I didn't grow up with them. I don't know them. Um, but I ask about their background. Hey, where did you grow up? Where were you born? And they'll walk me seamlessly through where they were born. You know, born in this state, born in this town, um, went to all these different places, grew up in this high school. Uh, they'll talk about where they met their wife, went to this college. It's just a list of all of these geographic locations. And I'm listening and I'm tracking. And if I've been to the place where that person grew up, then very quickly I'm able to follow with that individual. And I'm thinking of photographic memory. Yeah, I remember that place. I remember that restaurant. I've been to that school. Um, I'm able to track with my friend in this conversation. And something that happens if I've never been to that location and the person is describing their childhood. I'm trying to track with them. I'm like asking detailed questions. Okay, where is that at in relation to this? What does that look like? And eventually I'm kind of overwhelmed and I just listen. I'm like, okay, great. All right, wonderful. It's similar when it comes to P&G. Uh, there are so many different locations, so many different places. Um, I'll sit down with people and say, yeah, that's when we went to a mission base located here. It's named this. Well, then we were in this other location named this. And I want our time here to be able to benefit us in that way where we're able to walk away with an understanding of the geography of P&G as we think about church planting. But before we do that, I want to be able to look at the book of Acts and I want to look at some of the geography that we're already familiar with. And so questions to think through for Paul. In his day, he had logistical components that he had to think through when it came to church planting. And that's going to be very similar to P&G. Each one of the red roads that you see in that map is a Roman road attached to the Roman Empire. And all of those are making their intersections all throughout the Roman Empire. So move over to the next slide, and then I'll move back to it again. This is Paul's first, second, third missionary journey represented in there through those lines, as well as his journey in the book of Acts, Acts 27, where he goes um, from prison, moving his way over to Rome. Now, you've got seafaring and maritime concepts in there where he's going from this ship to this boat. Uh, he's got land travel that's occurring in there. Uh, the logistics of Paul's ministry were vast, um, and he utilized everything that was in place uh, in the Roman Empire. This is what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.10. Paul's most probably in Roman prison. He's awaiting his execution at the hands of Nero. In summing up his ministry, he writes this to Timothy, he says this. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
So Paul here, he does not mention the logistics of his ministry because it's simply the means of bringing the gospel to those he ministered to. So even as we look into logistics, we have to keep in mind the focus is church planting primarily. Now here's another example in 2 Corinthians 11, 23b through 27. Paul is laying out things that he had suffered for the sake of Christ in his ministry up until the time when he wrote this letter around 57 AD. And listen to his logistical means of transport in his list of dangers and calamities along the way. It says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold, in exposure. So Paul states here that he had encountered dangers both at sea and on land, in his journeys as a church planter throughout the Roman empire. Looking back at those Roman roads, um, I want us just to think about those roads and consider them. The Roman empire in Paul's day had an expansive system of roads, uh, like you can see in red with a hierarchy of building materials that very closely matches modern roads that we see today. The main roads were suitable for large caravans made up of heavy cargo, horses, camels, donkeys, people, Uh, The main roads that were suitable for those things also were designed to allow military forces to move with speed from one town to another for the prosperity of the empire. Make no mistake, the infrastructure for travel within the Roman Empire was incredible at that day and age. It was literally unmatched in the whole world. Roads were slightly arced in the middle, kind of like a turtle shell, allowing water to move quickly to the sides would not impede the travelers moving on it. They even had distance markers on the road so travelers knew how much further they were to their destination. I read one commentator, uh, as well as others, as I kept moving through commentaries, uh, who were saying that Paul probably traversed something around 10,000 miles on these roads. The majority most likely in his sandals. He would have covered best around 15 to 20 miles per day, moving from one city to the next. And as you consider the vast nature of these roads, it should not be surprising to find that the cities that Paul found himself planting churches in were the ones that were connected to these Roman roads. We didn't find Paul necessarily going into backcountry roads per se. He stuck with the main common roads that were part of the Roman Empire. So by contrast, If you weren't going to be an individual who was often walking and you wanted to make speed something that you wanted to have access to, well, then you could hop into a boat, depending on the season. And if you wanted to get to that distant location as a means to get away, maybe to get there by speed, or you had an enemy on land that you wanted to get away from, the ocean was a good way to do those things. And so there was a use of both smaller vessels uh, as well as massive cargo vessels used to transport grain for the Roman Empire. Uh, James Jeffers states this, that the larger vessels were weighing up to 1,200 tons, measuring up to 200 feet long. They did nothing but travel back and forth between Egypt and Italy, bringing hundreds of tons of grain to the masses in the city in Rome. Now, this is the same type of cargo vessel that Paul was aboard during his journey to Rome and shipwreck in Acts 27, in which Luke states that there were 276 people that were aboard. Josephus, a Jewish historian, he mentions that at the age of 26, having been on a similar vessel, had around 600 people when he was shipwrecked when he was on board. Now, just consider the size of that vessel, 600 people on board, and this is a regular caravan coming and going within the Roman Empire carrying grain. So he states that having treaded water all night, he was saved along with 80 other individuals on the ship as it passed by in the morning. So traveling by sea, which was an option in Paul's day, came both with speed, depending on the season, but then it also came with dangers. Uh, Paul names a shipwreck 
He actually names three of them in second Corinthians, which we read through. And the one that he mentions there, the three he mentions there doesn't even include the one that happens in Acts 27. So you could say that Paul sustained four shipwrecks that we know of. And then here, Josephus, another writer states that he also was in a shipwreck. You had dangers at sea, but you also had benefits that were there as well. Listen to this list. Here's a list of all the seaports that Paul utilized in the book of Acts. Chapter 13, Seleucia, Paphos, Persia. Chapter 14, Italia. Chapter 16, Troas, Simothrace, Neapolis. Chapter 18, Corinth, Ephesus. Chapter 20, Troas, Philippi, Azos, Mileti, Samos, and Miletus. Chapter 21, Kos, Rhodes, Patara, Myra, Tyre, Potomus, Caesarea. Chapter 27, Sidon, Myra, Fair Havens, Syracuse, and Regium. I know it's a brief summary, and I know we're moving kind of quick, but there was an incredible means of transportation in Paul's day, and that's just, it's just helpful to be able to see and think about. I mean, if I was going to draw a similarity, I would actually look at Western states or Western countries being very similar to what the Roman Empire was. Uh, I really don't think about logistics. I hop into my car and I drive where I need to go because the roads work. Uh, everything is consistent. I can get where I need to go. Another item that I wanted to look at uh, within the book of Acts before we go to P&G is just communication. So the normal means of communication in those days was not an iPhone, but an iLetter. You wrote it yourself and then you handed it to somebody, folded a couple of times, then sealed with a wax ring. And so businessmen and government agents and citizens of both means and individuals of poverty, they would send letters by a messenger. And on the Roman roads, the government had stations posted every 10 to 15 miles that served as supply outposts for letter carriers who were employed by the government service. Uh, They were able to find food and lodging through those outposts, although they were also places that drew attention from unsavory characters. Uh, The government themselves just laid out a platform for communication in order to move quickly. So you have a logistical structure that allows people to transport quickly, but it actually allows for communication to transport really quickly as well. A letter in the hands of a government official who is riding on a steed is able to make pretty quick headway as he moves from one town to the other delivering correspondence. In the New Testament alone, it's composed of 27 such letters. Many of those letters carriers are mentioned within the epistle themselves. The letters were folded several times, sealed with a wax singet, like a wax singet, like I said, allowing the recipient to know what its contents had and knowing that the contents were not read by anybody on the journey. And it was also critical that the character of the carrier of the letter uh, was proven. The individual who brought the letter was an individual who sat next to or was alongside of or was aware of the individual who wrote it. And so the communication that came from the letter could be clarified by the individual who brought it. One example of this is a letter written by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem to the church in Antioch in Acts 15. So they're responding here in Acts 15 to individuals who had come in and said, Um, believers that are Gentiles need to be circumcised and they need to follow the law of Moses. Well, this created a massive question. And so we have Paul and Barnabas going up to Jerusalem and they present this before the elders and the apostles that are there in Jerusalem. And they have the first church council to think through how do we need to think about Gentiles who are now saved? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow the law of Moses? And in Acts 15, Starting in verse 22, be thinking about letters and letter carriers and things like that. It says this. It says, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. And he lists the letter. Coming down to verse 27, we're still in the middle of the letter, and it says this. It says, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. The letter carriers here are going to communicate the things that were discussed in the meeting. Verse 30 it says, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced 
because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. That letter sent by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem was delivered by specific men. They were named in the letter. And once it was read, the men sent the letter where they repeated what was decided in the meeting. No doubt to provide any clarity that may have been needed. But don't forget that the letter or the means of how that letter got there uh, was secondary. Verse 32, as a result of that letter being writing or being written, says when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So that normative method of communication, letter writing, it affirmed faith in Christ alone was sufficient to save them. Gentiles had no need of circumcision or to follow the law of Moses to be saved. And so the regular means of communication, uh, which they didn't even give a second thought to it. They just wrote a letter. That's how you did it in that day. That means uh, was a joy and a delight for them. So Paul's sandals traversed thousands of miles on dependable Roman roads. They secured his feet as he stood on the decks of countless ships and they proceeded with him as he boarded and departed those ships through the wood slatted slipways. He wrote and had dictated many letters that were sent by trustworthy carriers to churches and individuals throughout the Roman empire. And he used the logistical resources that were available in his day so that the gospel would continue to be preached. Weary souls would be encouraged, sinning saints would be warned, young pastors would be charged to persevere in ministry, and false teachers would be confronted. Now, track this. If we consider the logistics in play in the book of Acts, a very well put together infrastructure, uh, letters were the thing that was commonly shared back and forth in terms of communication, roads that were reliable and sure, ships with regular trade routes that move back and forth, the gospel spread quickly, even though people had to walk from town to town. Sure. They were probably in better shape, but they were able to walk and communication was able to move back and forth. The gospel spread quickly throughout the Roman empire quickly. And it's helpful for us to think about that dependable, reliable infrastructure allows for things to run smoothly. Uh, speed is something that can actually happen. Take those things away and you end up in a very precarious PNG kind of environment, uh, which we're going to look at next. Everybody has seen that map, I'm hoping, and is aware that is the country of Papua New Guinea. Uh, you can see a line on one side, which is a vertical line that's yellow. And uh, that is an arbitrary line that just divides uh, Papua New Guinea from Indonesia on the other side. First thing I want us to look at is we're kind of just looking at topography and we're going to be looking at where things are in terms of the lay of the land. Uh, when you leave the United States and make your way to Papua New Guinea, you, you can't fly direct. You're going to make your way to Port Moresby first. And Port Moresby is the capital city all the way at the bottom. And you can see a line that shows the flight path that goes up to another city up at the top. Port Moresby is a city that is uh, large. It is the metropolis of the political empire of Papua New Guinea. All the PNG businessmen are there, skyscrapers. Uh, it is not a small city. It, it, it's large. And you find a, a gamut of individuals uh, in that town. It's just kind of weird and bizarre. I was talking to Ryan yesterday or their family, just about being in Port Moresby before, staying in a hotel that wouldn't, wasn't like a fancy hotel or anything like that. I'm there to meet with our agent that uh, submits government documentation on our behalf. I walk into an elevator, and there's a New Guinean with a suit on, him and another guy. And I'm just like trying to make small talk. I'm like, hey, so what do you do? It's like, oh, like, yeah, I serve people and stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, great. All right. I, I work in my dang. And I think at this point, I'm probably wearing shorts and flip-flops, and I've got a T-shirt on. And he's just like, who in the world is this guy? He walks out of the elevator and then joins one of the political parties. There's all these individuals that are New Guineans, all with their suits on, making their plans for what they're going to be doing as they're campaigning for the next election. And so interacting with government political officers like that in the same hotel, I walk outside and there's an individual that is a, a, a squatter or a bum on the street. And so just the contrast is stark uh, in the town. 
Uh, Port Moresby is just where business and things of that nature regularly occur. And that is the place where we have to do things like submitting government documentation. Uh, you need a work permit to get into the country. You need to have an entry visa to be in the country. We have to pay taxes as an organization to be in the country. Uh, if any of those things disappear uh, very quickly, we're, uh, we're moved out of the country and unable to be there. If we move to a different elevation, uh, we can see the result of that flight path. So we left Port Moresby, and now we've made our way to Medang. Uh, Medang is at the bottom of this map. And as you're looking at the map, you can see that mountain range that's highlighted in green with a yellow band going around it. That range is the Finisterre Mountain Range. That is the area uh, that we're looking at. So Medang is primary ministry of church planting as well as logistical administrative support. And the Finisterre Mountains you can see here are also a primary focus of where we want to send church planting teams. You're also able to see here as I move into Medang, we can see the base in Medang. You can tell that it's just a hideous place to live. The ocean is there and just all the tropical greenness and wonderfulness. And so individuals have to suffer who are, who are working there. Every day you walk outside and you're like, my goodness, I have to look at this. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And so this is, this is our base in Medang. You can see on this slide that you've got an aerial view, and you've got on one side, you've got blue and something that's kind of highlighted and green on the other. When we first went to Medang, um, our family, when we were there, we lived in this little highlighted spot that's green. It shows two little buildings on one side of the street, and that was our Kina Beach house. Uh, we loved that house. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but then about a year and a half ago, we actually entered into an agreement with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators called SIL in Papua New Guinea. And we started leasing their property, which is highlighted in blue. And so you can tell just based on the size, we have more space on the ground to be able to handle things like house building. Where do we stage products and things in preparation for that? You can also see that the buildings are larger. Uh, if I move over to this shot, you can see some of the greenness of the property. Two buildings represented there, and uh, we can get into more details about those things as time goes on, but I wanted you guys to at least be able to see that and think about what Medang is. The, the property is big enough for us to be able to house uh, two to three families that would make up that Medang team. Next view here is now rotated again. We've got Medang kind of in the upper right. And now we can see the first team that we have in the Finisterres. We can see Maui Roro kind of laid in the middle there, the Finisterres. We've got two small towns uh, that are more coastal. And I say town in parentheses. You've got one location that's more of a village called Biliao uh, that is on the coast in red. And you've got another there called Sidor. Sidor is a very small town. You've got police presence there and you've got an airport. Biliao doesn't have either of those things. So... Uh, a grouping of people to come together in a place where there's no police support is going to be, uh, it's going to come with all the things you probably think it comes with. It's going to come with those things. The side door is large enough where you're able, to, you're able to mitigate some of those issues. Here's another angle we can rotate and look at. And this allows us to pivot back and see two locations that are in the Highlands region. On one side, we've got the New Tribes base, so it's New Tribes Mission. And that is called Lappy Low. You guys can get that into your mind. Lappy Low, Lappy Low. And then the other is SIL's base. So Summer Institute of Linguistics, also called Wycliffe. Um, their base is called Ukurumpa. Okay, not an Upalumpa, but Ukurumpa. Okay. And here is a picture of those bases. So Ukurumpa is SIL's base. Uh, it is more like a city. Uh, then it is a, uh, a small little outpost. Uh, they've got a grocery store that is there. They've got a whole construction and maintenance department. Um, we buy propane and things of that nature to be able to send that into the village. Uh, there are a lot of programs and essential tools there in Ukarempa that we utilize regularly. Uh, they have a whole aviation department as well, so planes and helicopters. Uh, we have SIL fly for us. They fly supplies in and out. This is the New Tribes Mission Base, Lapilo. And this base, uh, similar in terms of it being a structured base, much smaller, probably about a third of the size of what Ukarumpa is. And so these are the locations that are, that are critical to know, locations that are essential to know. Uh, there's times that uh, we'll do supply runs and things of that nature, and, and we're relying on SIL or New Tribes to be able to uh, send a plane or send a helicopter to allow supplies to go in 
uh, and be dropped off there in the village of Maui Roro. Next thing I want to be able to look at is uh, transportation roads. Uh, this gives you just a general overview of the road system in PNG. So every yellow line is a road, and those are the national roads. So think of I-17, the 101, 202, 303, I-10, um, all of those main roads we just rely on, and we expect that we'll hop on it. It's, it's going to be a fantastic road. We can drive everywhere. That, I mean, look at that, look at that map. That's it. And if you look at the bottom set of roads, you'll notice that they don't even connect into the top set. So if you're anywhere in the town of, Le, of Ley, which is a massive port city, Medang, anywhere up in the highlands, you don't even connect into the main capital city of Port Moresby. So all the main political um, correspondence moving back and forth, supplies and goods, it actually is not accessible by road. Here's an example of some road conditions in PNG. You both have good roads that are operating and running smoothly, and then you'll have a, a decent rain, and you'll have a landslide, and then the road that's been worked on is, is now down about 50 feet from where it was previously. Here's another example of just road conditions in PNG. Uh, the one that you see with the skyline, uh, that is uh, up in the highlands, that is a beautiful road. Um, and at the same time, the one that's on the right, is that same road, just in a different location. And depending on the rainy season, uh, depending on how things are moving in terms of water being moved off the roads, uh, you will have a road that goes from a very good condition into a very poor condition very quickly. And so even just looking at the roads, it's helpful just to think about that. Uh, P&G has only a total of 1,644 miles of paved road. That's it. Um, and the connections of those paved roads really is just difficult to navigate. We can move from Medang, which is our base of operations. We can drive all the way up into the highlands and get to SIL's base or get to New Tribe's base. Uh, we've done that as a family twice. And it is a pretty rugged road. Uh, it's one of those roads you don't drive reading a book and you're sightseeing on the way. It's uh, life or death, white knuckle gripped. I remember every time we've done it, by the time we get to the base we're staying at, I usually just have to lie down for about an hour or two hours because I'm so tense from driving, dodging people and pigs and potholes. Um, that's just common as you're driving. Regular things you get used to. Another item to think about is going to be travel by boat. Uh, here's just examples of boats and ships. Uh, the dinghy uh, that you've got there, about 20 foot, uh, 22 feet, and you find those with a 40 horsepower or a 60 horsepower motor on them. Uh, those are common in terms of travel, and we utilize those pretty regularly, individuals going from a dang and making their way up into the Finisterres. The boat that's on the right is actually the boat loaded up for house building for the first round of house building supplies that we dropped off in Billy Out. It was that boat called the Manam. Here's another boat that you'll commonly find in Medang. Uh, that is a barge called the Emily One. And that barge is a barge that we are, Lord willing, hoping to be able to utilize when it comes to future church planting teams. And so we have some resources available to us by ship. And again, that's, that's a common means of travel for people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the dinghies are regularly coming and going, and there's regular paths on the water for people to follow. Uh, here's an example of just being able to see what what a dinghy passage looks like, or passage you're moving from Medang, making your way up into Biliao. And you can see that faint line that it should have changed into a different color going from Medang all the way up to, to Biliao. Uh, that area right there is called Astrolay Bay. And as we look at that area in Astrolay Bay, it, it can be calm. There's mornings you wake up and it looks like a sheet of glass from your house in Medang. And there are other times where it is not a sheet of glass as you are on that water. Uh, I remember being in the middle of Astrolay Bay with Zach Can multiple times. And um, what they will do is they will have two tanks of uh, mixed petrol that they've got for their outboard motor. Okay? And, and they don't buy one that's big enough to be able to make the whole trip in one shot. So you buy two, and, and usually halfway in between the trip, you've got to stop, and then you've got to hook the other one up, right? Well, if you've got a good storm happening, um, these guys are typically smoking as they're changing out the fuel. It makes sense. It's a way to do it. Um, and Zach and I are sitting in the boat, and the waves are so big, you're moving up and then down. And so we're trying to not puke. 
but then you can't see the horizon because the horizon keeps disappearing as the wave rolls up above it. And um, so Zach and I are both kind of holding each other and trying to not throw up while they swap out the line and then get going again, move out of the wave and then start making our way again. Uh, but transportation is dangerous. Uh, it's very common that dinghies will capsize and individuals will die in the water. It's very common that a vessel uh, will go down. Uh, when we were doing our house building, um, we asked uh, the individuals that were um, captain, skipper of, uh, of this ship, you know, how, how many pounds can we load up on the boat? Well, he listed how many pounds we could list it. I forget what the tonnage was. Uh, but by the time we came and started loading stuff on the boat, we realized that he forgot about the weight of the fresh water, the weight of the engine, the weight of the transmission. He forgot about the weight of every other supply. He gave us the dry weight of the boat and what you could put on it, but not accounting for any of the things that were on there that mechanically needed to be there in order for the boat to move. And so you really just have an ignorance that's there even for the skippers, uh, which plays into some of the danger of being able to utilize those craft as you go. But... It's a good example of boats, ships, we've got roads, uh, we've got sea travel, uh, and then we have by foot. This is a profile view of the hike into Maui Roro. And so on the right-hand side, you can see that little blue line where you made your way to Biliao by dinghy, and then once you docked there, then you basically got out and you rested because you felt seasick, and then you ate something, so you're feeling better. And then you begin your 10-hour hike from Biliao all the way up into Maui Roro. And that profile at the bottom helps you just to have an idea in terms of what that kind of a trek is. Just how difficult is it? Uh, you go from sea level all the way up to nearly 5,000 feet over a 13-mile period. And then you have a drop from nearly 5,000 feet all the way down to 2,200 feet. Uh, which occurs in less than a mile. And then you go back up 1,000 feet to walk and sit onto the veranda of Ryan Mitchell's house. And that occurs in less than half of a mile. And so you're exhausted. Uh, as you think about just the logistics and transportation, uh, imagine making that trek with no bag in your hand, you're exhausted. Now imagine I put a 45 pound bag of cement on your shoulder and say, all right, let's make the trip. And let's do that a hundred times. Um, the idea of logistics and moving supplies back and forth and doing it by hiking is, is, is just ridiculous to even think about. And so what I want everybody to feel is the need for a helicopter or a plane to be able to move those supplies. We don't have the infrastructure uh, that we do here in the States. Paul uh, had infrastructure that uh, our teams uh, in P&G do not have when it comes to logistics. And so every aspect of trying to get the gospel where it needs to go uh, is just more difficult. It doesn't mean impossible. It just means more difficult. I want to spend a little bit of time as we think about Mari Roro, the hiking, the logistics there. We can shift at the time we have left. We can look at Medang Town. Um, Medang is a beautiful uh, city, and it also comes with the difficulties uh, that come with the town of Medang, but at the same time, uh, it also comes to just the benefits of its beauty. Uh, it, is a, it is a place that our family loved living and we enjoyed for the five years that we had there. This is a logistical map of Medang Town. Uh, Medang Town, again, is going to be not only the supply hub for our teams that are in the Finisterres, but it also is our church planting ministry as well. And so the roads in and out of Medang Town um, are quick. Uh, that yellow path that goes all the way into the town from Medang and then loops back around, uh, that is about two miles in and two miles back. And so it'd be like making your trip to your grocery store that you like here in town, but you just traverse the entire town of Medang. Uh, it's not very big. Uh, it's, it's frankly very small. All the blue pins that are on there uh, represent grocery stores, places where you'd be able to get supplies for uh, food, eating in the home, and then everything that's blue on that list, um, blue or purple, I forget which one I just said. Um, the other ones are going to be for construction materials, supplies, and things of that nature. Uh, you've got the airport up at the top of the map, and you can see that the plane literally comes in right on the water and then lands at the airport. It's beautiful as that comes in. And you can see down at the bottom, the Finisterre base uh, is where our base is located in relation to the map. 
And so when it comes to Medang Town, there's not only stores uh, in Medang Town, but there's also people in Medang Town. We built sweet relationships with a lot of individuals in Medang Town. Um, and this is going to be a, a lifeline for the missionaries that are in the Finisterres. Now, one of the key things that has to happen regularly uh, for the missionaries that are on the field is that there's a need for them to be able to be supplied. Uh, that means things like food, construction materials, toilet paper, uh, very practical things, cleaning supplies, um, hoses, and things that are needed when things break in the village. Uh, they're looking to Medang and the logistical arm of Finisterre to be able to supply all those things. And so those things need to be flown in. Now, there's, there's times where they can be taken by dinghy and then be hiked in. Uh, we've had individuals do that in the past, uh, but it's not ideal. But I want to give you guys just two flight paths to be able to look at. If we do a supply run, let's say that one of our teams says, hey, we just need to do a very simple supply run. We need to send around 900 to 1,000 pounds of supplies into the village. And that's going to last us for the next two months something of that nature. Um, okay, well, then we'll be able to do that. So again, we're going to utilize New Tribe's base in Lapilo, or we're going to utilize SIL's base in Nukarumpa. And you're able to see that flight path. Uh, a single helicopter uh, will be dispatched from New Tribe's or from SIL and fly its way around the Finisterres and then navigate directly into Maui Roro, uh, where the Cairns and the Mitchells are currently located. Now, let's say we have a larger supply run that we need to do. In that kind of a situation, uh, we'd move to where we're going to utilize a plane as well as utilizing a helicopter. So a plane, I mean, we can move something in the order of about 2,000 pounds of supplies onto a plane, which is going to keep missionaries supplied for quite a while. But there's no airstrip in Maui Roro, and so a helicopter has to be utilized as well. Uh, you can see the orange line there would represent a plane. And so let's say that SIL was going to be able to support us uh, for this. SIL would send a fixed wing plane all the way to the town of Medang. Supplies would have been previously purchased there. And so 2,000 pounds of supplies would be put onto that fixed wing aircraft there. At the same time, a helicopter would be dispatched from the same location, but that would fly directly to Maui Roro uh, into the Finisterres, drop off supplies there. And then the plane will leave Medang and fly all the way to Sidor. That is the location there on the coast where there's an airstrip that functions and works well. And the helicopter will leave and then join up with that fixed wing aircraft. And they'll take that 2,000 pounds, split it up into two 1,000 pound loads, and then fly that in back and forth to get that entire supply into the village. And so as you think about just the movement of supplies, it would be so much easier if there was a paved road that went from Medang all the way to Biliao, and then even a dirt road uh, that made its way from Biliao up into Maui Roro. Um, those things just, they don't exist. Uh, the Lord has, in his kindness and sovereignty, he has kept the infrastructure established the way that it is. Um, but he has also provided means, uh, means like helicopters, means like planes, uh, things like dinghies, things like larger boats and roads for us to be able to do those things. And he's also provided us with good communication in Papua New Guinea. Uh, when, Zach's, uh, when Zach made the phone call, the bolt houses had collapsed. Um, he was able to call me from the middle of the jungle, 7,000 miles away. Uh, there's a means of communication. And even if his phone went offline, uh, he has the ability through a small SAT app a texting device to be able to shoot me a text message. We, we have a means of communication there uh, that is regular and established. And it allows us to be able to have a speed in ministry in Papua New Guinea that we wouldn't have otherwise. So let's kind of get to the end and think about closing up logistics and PNG. I, I'm not expecting for you to remember everything, but it's one more exposure of being able to think about logistics in Papua New Guinea. What are the names of the ports and the towns and the cities? What does travel look like in PNG? What does communication look like in PNG? Um, every exposure provides us with the ability to understand a little bit more. Um, what are the things um, that are beneficial in a presentation like this? Well, it helps each one of us just pray better about everything that's happening in Papua New Guinea. We're able to understand the complex nature of logistics as we labor to send church planters to Papua New Guinea. 
I were able to think about, I mean, the roads are just, they're hard there. Uh, I need to be praying more fervently uh, as this trip is going to be coming up for this missionary that we're regularly checking in with. Um, there's a supply run that's happening. Oh man, right. There's going to be all these other individuals involved in that. I, ju- I just need to be praying about the components of those things. It helps us to be thankful for the infrastructure in Papua New Guinea that's even there. Uh, if we went back even something in the nature of about 20 years, the, the means of communication that we have in Papua New Guinea now is far different than what it is, uh, what it was then compared to what it is now. Um, you're able to make a phone call. You're able to have fast internet connections. There's so much to be thankful for in those things. Uh, and then the other is just the need to have more individuals go and labor in an environment that it's just difficult to have ministry in. The infrastructure is such where it just requires more people to go, more time to be able to minister. And so with those things, let me pray and we will wrap up. Heavenly Father, God, I, I praise you, Lord, for the labors uh, to this church, a Grace Bible Church, um, Lord, has had in sending missionaries to Papua New Guinea. God, we are not the first uh, church to do such things. Many individuals have labored uh, in these things, labored in sending missionaries to Papua New Guinea, a place that is vast and diverse and disconnected from the world, as it were, a place that in one sense is forgotten by the world and yet a place that is very present and close and real to each one of us. I pray God that you would raise up more laborers, more individuals, more church planters that would have a desire to take the gospel to a place that is foreign and unknown. And yet there are souls there in desperate need of a savior to save them. Now the gospel is sufficient, not only to save people, but also to change them. Uh, There is a sanctifying nature to the gospel where we are saved and made right in your eyes through Christ's work on the cross. But then there is also the nature of being changed into one who loves Christ and desires to obey and to follow him. And Lord, Papua New Guinea, because of the darkness of individuals' hearts, because the gospel is that which has not penetrated into the heart of Papua New Guinea. Individuals have not been changed from the heart level. The things that continue to exist in PNG, both government relations and individuals interacting with one another, um, Lord, are those which are far more in lawless nature than they are anywhere else. And pray, God, that you would give uh, the church, your church, more individuals that would go and labor in Papua New Guinea. And I ask these things in Christ's name.